Certainly when I first heard about program science, uh, Sean had introduced me to the concept a few months back. I read the papers, listened to uh, the presentations today. Uh, you know, my reaction was, I think, what Jamie started with. This is what I've been doing my whole life, okay? Um, you know, and I can go back, technology assessment, iterative loop, Peter Tugwell, who remembers that, you know, 25 years ago. It's all the concepts are there, program planning evaluation, complexity theory, interdisciplinary work, um, economic evaluation of complex health. Like, it's all there. Um, and, you know, I think I, I've also been around long enough to know that you got to put a new label on an old bottle every once in a while to get the funding agencies and to get ministers, because they don't want to go announce the last government's thing. So I, I can understand why putting this label onto what we've been doing all along might help in getting new money. But let's not get too full of it. That would be my first caution, because recognize all the great work that's been uh, come before and uh, really continue to build on it. Um, one Health, um, you know, the interrelationship of systems. You know, people, the veterinarians have been talking about One Health for many years. And let's pay attention to them rather than trying to reinvent it in our own uh, small circles. So, you know, what I see about program science is it's all about breaking down silos. That's what we've been talking about all morning. And, and between research and academe, between different disciplines, between different program areas. Again, be really careful. Don't build new silos. And I, as I've sat through this morning, as someone who's got to look across the breadth of all of public health, I'm really concerned about silos being built up within an area. And in fact, many of the intervention solutions we talked about are getting out of HIV and looking at housing or other interventions. So. And, you know, when Dr. Wilson was presenting some of the numbers this morning, I was reminded of a meeting I went to in Guyana a few years back. And, in fact, I was invited to talk to the ministers about uh, social determinants of health. And I was at the CARICOM, Caribbean Community Headquarters building. And uh, it's the small sort of uh, two-story building. If anyone's been there, you know it's about 30 years old. And across the street is this amazing high-rise structure. So what's that? It's the HIV program building. And we got the grant from the European community to put this up. So here I am talking to them about social determinants of health. And you know, across the street, most of their resources are going into HIV programs. And yet we know that they have to be, and they know as well, that they have to be focusing on things like housing and incomes and so on, if they're going to deal not only with HIV, but all of their other big health issues, obesity, and uh, childhood issues, tuberculosis. So let's not build new silos as we're trying to break down the other silos. Um, and you know, on the Millennium Development Goals, I can't say it the way Stephanie did, but I looked at that slide and I thought, that's great. That's what we've been arguing for for the last 30 years in public health, that the improvements to health are going to come from the social determinants. And all the words that were big on that in that word diagram are those social determinants that we've been pushing for. So, you know, I don't think we have to take credit that it's about health. And if the health shrinks, but what we're getting the goals set on are the things that are actually going to make the difference for health, let's go for the ride. And so, um, you know, again, so my first sort of constructive piece here is let's not worry about our own identities, let's not worry about our own areas. If we can get people onto the right path, uh, then let's follow along. Um, in terms of what needs to change, you know, we've heard a lot about recognizing multidisciplinary work, recognizing applied work. And I'll, you know, I'll start with sort of the academic research side. And, and I'll just, you know, I'll preface these comments by saying, you know, my last job was as the provost of the University of Toronto. So, you know, I know how academic appointment, tenure, promotion processes work. I, I read about three, 400 files a year. So I've seen them across all the disciplines. We're terrible in the health sciences, okay, in recognizing multidisciplinary work and uh, applied work. And other disciplines do it really well. We're going to hear from the dean a lot in a minute. Uh, I used to get the files from the law faculty, 
and people would be giving advice to Supreme Court and royal commissions and stuff like that, and that was being recognized for the, as scholarship. We don't do a good job of doing that, and we get hung up on a biomedical project-based model. Um, CIHR, not gonna offend don't Erica. <laughs> I'm not gonna pick on Erica, because despite the great work that Erica and the institutes have done and the advisory boards on trying to support interdisciplinary work, and, and I'll actually throw the challenge back out on both appointments and promotions in the academic setting and grant reviews to the community. Because it's the peer review process that actually falls back into looking at traditional metrics. We do it to ourselves. You know, you go into any university's promotions manual, create a professional activity at the University of Toronto, it's recognized. You can go in and recognize like, all the kind of work that we do and what the institutes have been, but when the stuff gets to a peer review panel, it comes apart. On the government and institutional side, we've heard a lot about this. You know, it's the challenge and you know, it's the world that we all live in, the accountability requirements, they wind up being siloed. The time frames that I said, you know, I still don't have my budget letter for the year. Last year I got March 30th, I got my uh, business plan approved for the fiscal year that ended the next day. So, you know, we all work in this world, right? And, you know, I think Jamie hit it on the head. You know, we, we, we fund programs, we fund activities, and for individuals, we have to really think about the communities, and we have to think about funding models, and they exist out there, they've been tested and so on, that fund communities to stay healthy, right? Communities to stay healthy. And so in Ontario, we've got our new funding model for hospitals, it's called the health-based allocation method, but it's actually patient-based. I said to people in the ministry, you know, if it was really health-based, you'd be incenting LINs to keep people healthy, and you wouldn't want that with a lot of money going to hospitals. But, um, but if you really wanted um, to think about it, and, and there are models out there, and we have to produce the research, we have to produce the support for that. Um, we have to engage practitioners and public who heard a lot about this, and it is great to see in the organization of meeting the broad uh, range of representation. But I think as Anita just spoke to, again, our structures are not set up for those people who can really inform what we want to do, whether it's from a research perspective or a program perspective, they're not set up for those people to be able to be engaged, um, to take time away from what they have. And we still have not really uh, cracked how we do public engagement. Um, and we've got some great experiments. Uh, the Change Foundation has a panorama panel that's coming together. Andres Lopakis at St. Mike's has done work on citizens engagement. Uh, but we have not systematically uh, done it, and I, I would really say the HIV AIDS community has probably done it the best, and maybe the breast cancer community as well in the last few years. So my final message will be back to the program science crowd, uh, because I think there, there's really a lot of great stuff. I, I don't want to come out nihilistic, uh, but I think as we saw in this morning's discussion, um, the, the, I saw there was a lot more in the 15 minute discussion period than I read in the papers and the presentations. And so I think you do need to think about the articulation, what makes it different, and, and, and present it in a way uh, that is uh, very clear for people to grasp what's new about it. And I would, uh, you know, I, I would agree with the uh, definition, but I take exception with what follows the definition in the paper. The end point for program science is the population level impact on the incidence of infections. I'd actually change that to the population level impact on human health, right? Because again, you're narrowing yourself by focusing in on the incidence of infections right there up front. Thank you. Okay.